Our diver is Alec Pierce again from Scuba 2000 with another from our Vinti Scuba playlist. I hope you enjoy the the uh, the uh, playlist, uh, the Vinti Scuba I did on masks. Now, after I finished that and Kevin edited it and we posted it, I realized the darn thing is really, really long. I think it's 15 or 20 minutes long. It's crazy. And I apologize for that. You know, if it was me searching YouTube, I see something that's more than about 15 minutes long. I don't even look at it. It's just too long. I haven't got that much time. Uh, however, I must admit I did watch that one completely because it was kind of interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to try to keep these short now. You know, five, maybe ten minutes. Occasionally, I might drift into eleven or twelve. You know me a little bit now, and once I get started talking on a subject, it's hard for me to stop. And I'm going to try to keep them short, short, short topics. A whole bunch of them, but short, so you can pick and choose, and uh, you don't have to tie up too much of the boss's time on the computer watching them. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying uh, these uh, these uh, vintage uh, scuba tips. Uh, there's still a couple of tech tips out there, but watch for these. Oh, and soon we're going to have Sea Hunt, Sea Hunt playlist, specifically talking about Sea Hunt only. You know, some of you know that I have the largest collection of Sea Hunt memorabilia in the world. If some of you don't know what Sea Hunt is, just Google it, Sea Hunt, and uh, you'll find out that it's pretty exciting. Anyway, let's go on today. Today we're going to talk about one of the most common subjects that comes up in scuba diving circles, and that's tank valves. Now, specifically, because this is a vintage scuba uh, episode, we want to talk about old tank valves. And that means that we have to talk about K valves and J valves. Yeah, K valves and J valves. Now, if you have been diving for more than 10 or 15 years, you almost undoubtedly have heard that terminology, K valves and J valves. If you've only been diving for a few years, five years or less, you probably have no idea what a J valve is, or a K valve for that matter. You've been using a K valve for the last five years or so, but you have no idea what it is. Well, I'm going to see if I can share some interesting insight about the development of scuba tank valves. And I'm going to specifically, certainly for you older divers anyway, help you to dispel some of the myths regarding uh, the naming J valves and K valves. Let's get started right away. Okay, over here on, uh, on your right, there is a tank. This is an old tank. Matter of fact, this tank is uh, 1960. This is an old Voigt tank. This is an old, old tank. Still works. Still a good old tank. It's a galvanized steel tank, standard old 72. That 80 cubic foot tank, which is a standard today, 80 cubic foot aluminum tank, this is the one that you probably use and you see at dive resorts. And this, this is the standard today. There are other tanks for specific purposes. But the 80 cubic foot tank is the standard. It has been since the old mid 80s. But prior to that, folks, that wasn't there was no aluminum back then. It was too expensive. Uh, back then, it was the steel tank. And this is the one. This is a steel 72. Interestingly, another topic, maybe it holds 65 cubic feet. What do they call the 72? Anyway, that's another whole story. We'll deal with that maybe. But this is the old standard tank. And it has at the top of the tank, of course, the tank valve. The tank valve is there for a very specific reason, to control the air. Let air out, stop the airflow when you take the rail and so on. You know what the valve is for, to turn the air off and on. Well, this is, the again, the standard valve from those days, from the 60s. It looks a little bit different from your valve. This is what your valve today looks like. I have this valve from one of our rental tanks, an aluminum 63 cubic foot tank. This is what a tank valve looks like today. What the heck is this thing? Well, this is what was called in those days a, a pillar valve, P-I-L-L-A-R, a pillar valve, meaning it was vertically stacked. You see, so it's the very same as today's valve. You have the threads, in this case, going to the valve, and then you have the opening sealed with an O-ring. On the back, you have a safety. I can see it back here, and you have a little hole for the regulator knob to fasten into, and then above that is the on-off knob. It's up here, you see? On-off. Little knob. You turn it on, you turn it off, just as you do today. And this is the way they were built, originally. <clears throat> uh, they have changed over the years, obviously. You've not seen one of these. I doubt very many of you have, but this is the original pillar valve. They had a few problems with them. Uh, first of all, they didn't. They weren't O-ring sealed, so, so it was a bit of a, a task to uh, take them out and put them back in for a visual examinations and so on. They were actually a pipe thread, so it was a tapered thread. And you had to put on special Teflon tape and use about a four foot long wrench and get them in there good and tightly. A little bit of work. <clears throat> That's been solved with the new valves. New valves now just come out by, by hand. They are torqued in a little bit, but not hard. A good hard bang on the valve and they actually come out because they're all ring sealed. We'll talk about that some other time too. The, there were a couple of problems with this valve. Because the valve knob itself is exposed, and the valve knob itself is rather fragile because the valve knob up here is mounted on a very, very small threaded rod that goes down in and turns it off and on. So this got a, a bang on the side. It was very, very common. 
<clears throat> for this knob actually to get knocked right off, break that stem, or at the very least to bend it. And it made it very, very hard. So the valve had to be rebuilt, and it was just a nuisance. The other difficulty with this valve <clears throat> was that it, it, if you opened it all the way to the end and then went diving, <clears throat> sometimes when you finished the dive and came back to the surface, purged the regulator, and tried to turn this off, you couldn't turn it off. Yeah, it's because of the construction. The very, very small openings and the different types of metals in this type of valve is that occasionally, in fact, more than occasionally, if the valve was all the way open tightly, at the end of the dive, you would find that the metals had, had changed in such a way that it jammed the valve open. A bit of a nuisance because you couldn't get the valve turned off, so you couldn't turn off the flow of air, so you, you couldn't get your regulator off. There was a way around that, but it was a real nuisance. I'm going to just mention that, and I take a second right here to, to, to dwell on it because <clears throat> That problem has been solved with modern valves. So, especially you older divers, when you took your course, if your instructor told you to put the regulator on and open the valve all the way and then turn it back a little wee bit, he was wrong. That little piece of advice was good advice when we had pillar valves so they wouldn't freeze open or jam open at the end of the dive. But with modern valves, that won't happen. So with modern valves, you actually, in fact, should put your regulator on and then open the valve all the way so it's wide open. You don't jam it open, just open it until it stops and leave it there. Don't turn it back. A little bit of that interesting trivia. So this was the original pillar valve, and this was called a K-valve. I'm going to explain why it's called a K-valve in just a minute. K-valve today is this one. This is the one you're familiar with. You put your regulator on, you open the knob, and you go diving. Just that easy. You open the knob, air comes out, and you go diving. Just that simple. Very similar. It fits in differently. It's a, it's a machine thread straight, so it just screws in with an O-ring seal. Still has a safety disc, same as this one, and a knob on the side. So this knob, you see, not only is it much more robust and protected by a metal shield in there, so even if it did get hit, it's less likely to break or even bend, but also you can see it's much lower profile, not sticking up like this, much lower profile, protected a bit by the tank, much less likely to be damaged. And this valve, of course, is easy. You open and close much easier components now, and the materials used are such that it won't freeze open. But this essentially is still a K-valve, or on-off valve, if you like, or we just call it a tank valve. Since all valves are like this now, we just call it the tank valve. If there's only one, why give it a designation? There was another type of valve that was available in the old days as well. Take a look at this one right here, this one right here. Now compare this if you would. I'm not, not kidding if you can do that, but can you compare this one with that one over there? I'm just going to see if I can't move this tank over here carefully. I don't want these tanks to fall and land on my foot because I only have two. There we go. So you see, can you see the similarities? Suppose I close to hide this. Now the valves are identical. You see that? It's a pillar valve. It is a pillar valve. Yep. It stands up straight as the knob, control knob on the top. But it has a couple of extensions on here. Let's disregard this extension. That's not too really important to us. But over here on this side, on your right hand side, there's a, oh, look at this neat little lever over here that flips up and down. What the heck is that for? Just a toy, I guess. No, there's actually a very, very good reason for that lever. We want to talk about that. That's what this episode is all about. This is called a J valve. So we have a K valve and a J valve. Now, J valves aren't made anymore. You won't see J valves anymore unless it's an older tank, of course. In fact, this tank, which is from the 70s, <clears throat> is an example of a modern J valve, just as old K valves developed into new K valves. Old J valves also developed and became better and better and better, and they eventually ended up looking like this. This is a J valve as well. Knob on the right for turning air off and on, and then here's this funny J lever on the side. Well, what's that for? Well, you probably already know where I'm going with this. This was a spring-loaded constant reserve, okay? Well, we better explain why we had to have a constant reserve. You need to appreciate that when I started diving, you had to have a J-valve. If you did not have a J-valve, quite frankly, you were suicidal. Every diver had a J-valve. It was critical, absolutely critical to have a J-valve, to have that constant reserve. To explain what the constant reserve is, is very simple. You would be diving, the J-valve would be up, you'd be diving along and enjoying yourself, having a good dive, and then all of a sudden you would begin to realize it's getting hard to breathe. <sighs> What's happening? <sighs> so then you would turn this knob down like that, and the last 300 PSI of air available in the tank would come up, <sighs> and you'd be able to breathe, and you'd say, okay, buddy, i got to go up, I'm on my reserve. So that makes, it makes sense, huh? it seems like a good idea. You had to have that in the old days. Why did you have to have it? Well, let me explain something else that might... Uh, might be interesting for you, might be frightening actually. We did have pressure gauges back in the 50s and 60s. It looked like this old brass contraptions with a pressure gauge up here and a little bleeder knob and so on. 
And with this device, we can measure the, the, the pressure of the air in our tank. So at the very beginning of the dive, actually be just before we went in the water, we would, of course, check to make sure that our tank was full of air. Smart. We, I mean, we weren't, we were old. We weren't dumb. So we'd use the pressure checker, put it on the tank, open the valve. Okay, 20, 2250. That was a full tank in those days, not 3,000. 2250. Got a full tank of air, guys. You take the pressure gauge off, and then you put your regulator on. This is a regulator. That was it. That's the whole thing. Yeah, oh, it didn't have any BC hoses. That didn't have BCs. Didn't have a pressure gauge. Didn't have a safe second. We had octopuses, but we ate them. That was the regulator. So you put your regulator on, and off you go diving. You see? And then sometimes through the dive, you might have to use the reserve as the man. Then after you got back to the surface, you could use the pressure checker to check the air remaining in the tank. As I jokingly say, you could check and make sure you had enough air for the dive that you just finished. <laughs> anyway, so we had pressure gauges, but they were only useful on the surface. There weren't submersible pressure gauges, SPGs as they're commonly called. The first SPG, submersible pressure gauge, was this one. Look at that. Pretty neat, huh? And on the end of this, you can see the pressure gauge. This is called the Sea View by Sportsways. This pressure gauge was the very first one, came out in about 1962. Okay? I'd already been diving for four or five years by 62. We obviously didn't have pressure gauge prior to that. This particular pressure gauge brought out by Sportsways, a company that was owned and operated by a very good friend of mine, Sam Lecoque, made a lot of really neat inventions. This was probably his biggest and best because shortly after this came out and divers realized the benefit of having a pressure gauge, this slowly but surely became mandatory equipment. And as you know today, on a scuba system, a regulator system, you need to have some way of monitoring your air pressure. That's, that's the very first one. It doesn't swivel. You see, the whole the gauges at the end, you had to look at it like this, it's pretty neat. Old, but it still worked really, really well. <clears throat> so from then on, we had a pressure gauge. See, the J-valve was great, probably saved a lot of divers' lives. But essentially, the J-valve told you that you're out of there. Well, I don't want to know that I'm out of air. I want to know how much I have. Hence, the pressure gauge is a big, big jump in technology and safety for scuba divers. But there we are. So we have them. Now, how did this J-valve actually work underwater? Well, it was really very simple. In those days, we didn't have buoyancy compensators. We had packs, backpacks. So the pack would be something like this. You see, it would go on the tank like so and clamp on. And you had straps like so to fasten to your shoulders. You'd put your regulator on the top and off you went. It was neat. And on the side of the tank, in this J-valve knob, lever, if you like, there would be attached this steel rod. Anybody know what the steel rod is called? Stretch your imagination. It's called a J-rod. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Anyway, this is called the J-Rod. And the J-Rod fastened to the side of the pack in some way, like so, so that <clears throat> when you <laughs> ran out of air, you see, you'd reach back with your left hand and grab this knob, and pull it down, and then you're, oh, away you go. You got extra air knob if you went. Worked pretty well. These were not 100% uh, not reliable, but they were pretty good. <laughs> One of the problems was that quite commonly you'd be diving in a shipwreck or maybe in a kelp forest or whatever, and through the dive, unknown to you, this would get pulled down. You see, there's not much holding it there, so something would catch and pull it down. Whoa, now when you go, <laughs> you're out of air. <laughs> you reach back to pull the J-Rod down for your two or three minutes of extra air, it's already down. Yeah, yeah, it happened more than once. As a matter of fact, years ago, I used to ask my new divers, how do you know that your dive buddy is a good dive buddy? And the answer to that question was, he is regularly reaching back to make sure his J-rod is up through the dive. You just check it every once in a while. You don't want to get to the end of the dive and find it is already down. You're completely out of there. Pretty slick, huh? So that's the way the old valves work. Now, I want to share just a couple more things with you that are related to this. First of all, <clears throat> pressure gauges are so important that there were early versions of pressure gauges. Here's an early version of a pressure gauge. It's a little metal knob that goes into the regulator. Early regulators didn't even have ports for these things, but this particular one did. And there's a little, you can barely see a little pin that sticks up there. And then on, the, on, the, on the shield, on the flat part, where that pin comes up through the center part, there's a 1,000, and there's a 2,000, and there's a 3,000. And if you look carefully, you can see that your tank had somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. Not great, but better than nothing, right? So that was some of the early attempts. But generally speaking, in the old days, we depended on J valves. In fact, they were so important that when you went diving, sometimes certain at resorts down south, you wanted to be sure you had a J valve. Sam Lecoque, the inventor of the uh, SPG, first SPG, invented another device, <clears throat> which you could put onto your K valve, one of these, because a lot of divers are used K valves. 
they were six dollars cheaper than a JVAL, why would they spend the extra money? And I say, if you get down to Mexico or wherever you're dieting, and you're, the tanks they rented had K valves on them. So Sam McCoke had this neat device that you put on <clears throat> to the K valve and had a built in J, built in reserve. And then you put your regulator onto that device, and there you go. You change the K valve tank into a J valve tank, and you could, or some divers did this. Gives you an idea of how important J valves are. This is a regulator, good old regulator made by a very, very big, very fine company called Healthways, long gone now. This is the first stage. Look at that really nice. <clears throat> internal knob. See how smooth it is? It doesn't have the big knob. It's in built in. Pretty neat. What's this thing on the side? Look over here. What's that? This regulator has a built in constant reserve. Look at that. So you put the regulator on and you still have a reserve. That's how important they were. We had to have J-valve. As I said earlier, you don't have a J-valve, you know, you're just not a safe diver. That's just how important they were. So now you know a little bit about K-valves, how they changed, and J-valves now how they changed and have now disappeared. They've disappeared because we now have submersible pressure gauges. We actually monitor our air pressure. We don't wait until we're out. We actually monitor it. So now it begs the question, okay, Alec, <clears throat> why J-valves and K-valves? And I ask that question quite regularly. And it's pretty funny sometimes I get people and they say, well, you know, if you look at a J-valve sort of sideways and squint a bit, it looks like a J. That's why they're called, no, <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. Let me explain. This is kind of interesting as well. A long time ago in the 50s and 60s, there were no dive stores. There were no magazines. There were no textbooks. You basically learned how to scuba dive on your own or from popular mechanics or whatever information you could pick up. You couldn't Google. <laughs> Trust me. But there were companies that put out little magazines that told uh, how to scuba dive. So this is an early, early text. This is a text written by René Buzo. You don't know him, but let me tell you something. René Buzo is very important to you. He was the first man to bring regulators from France into North America and sell them. Interestingly enough, sorry about this to all my American friends, René Buzo brought them to Canada, to Montreal, set up a company to sell regulators, scuba regulators across North America. He found out pretty quickly that Canada wasn't the best place to try to develop a market for scuba diving. There were like six divers in Canada in 1958. And he moved to California and he started a company called, oh yes, U.S. Divers. And he sold his Aqualung through U.S. divers. But there's an early booklet, and in this booklet it actually tells you how to scuba dive. There's a chapter on pressure and the equipment. As a matter of fact, in those days, <clears throat> we knew all about our equipment. So he actually has a breakdown of the parts of the regulators and the valves and so on. You see, there's a cable, all the parts and pieces in there, because we had to fix our own. In those days, we actually changed our own tires. My gosh, think about that. No way, you didn't call CAA, you actually fixed your own equipment. But here we go. Now, this is actually the very first catalog put out by <clears throat> a company, U.S. Divers, years and years ago, Aqualung. This is 1954. This is actually four or five years before even I started diving, this, this little booklet. This little booklet was free. These booklets, by the way, folks, just to give you an idea about vintage equipment, some of it, these booklets sell sometimes for as much as $1,000. Yeah, if in good shape like this one. But I wanted to show you about K-Valve and J-Valve. Now, you see, there wasn't much scuba equipment now. You pick up a catalog today and there's pages and pages of neat junk. But in the old days, there wasn't much scuba equipment. You essentially, you could, you could buy a tank and with some bands on it. So you can see you can buy, I don't know, Kevin, if you can sue in here, but you can buy a single tank with a K-valve and straps to hold it on. Not even a pack, just straps. Or you could buy a double with a K-valve and straps and so on. So there wasn't much, that, that's it, that's it for tanks. Okay, let's go to valves, because you had to choose the valve that you wanted. Let's go to the valve page, and here we are on the valve page. <clears throat> There's all the valves available, right? all the combinations, all the different types. Okay, and there weren't very many available. In fact, <clears throat> there were less than 26 pieces available. You, you catching on here where I'm going with this? As a matter of fact, if you look carefully on this page, okay, the valve page, you'll find the K valve and the J valve. Right there, you see that valve right there, Kevin? Can you zoom in there? Right there, that valve, and right beside the little letter K. That's that valve over there, that's it. So if you want a K valve for your tanks, you went to the catalog, and you said, oh, that's the one I want, and you called your local dive store or distributor and said, yeah, I want five K valves. That's why they were called K valves. The J valve was called a J valve because it was a J valve. <laughs> In other words, if you look up here, you'll see there's a J valve, and it's called J. And you go over here and it says J-Valve, built-in constant reserve. You say, hey, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to change my K-Valves 
and the J valves. She called, yeah, 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 yeah. U.S. divers, yeah, yeah. I think I want to change my. I want J valves now. J valves. So the reason they're called K valves and J valves is because that's the designation in the 1954 catalog, and they became called J valves and K valves for many, many, many years. Hence the name J valve and K valve. Now, as I said earlier today, we don't call it J valve or K valve. Now it's just a valve because there are no K's or J's anymore. There's just one type of valve, pretty much, essentially. There you go. So a little bit of trivia. You probably won't ever see one of these catalogs anywhere else, not that I know of anyway. And now I have dispelled some of the myths, some of the ideas people have about why K valves and J valves. Now you know why. Because that was the designation in the very first cubic catalog. Pretty interesting. I hope that was interesting for you anyway. A little bit of talking about diving, how we went diving, how the valves changed, and J valves and so on. I'll share some more neat ideas and some of these additional regulators. Maybe next time we'll talk about sonic regulators. And that doesn't mean they played MP3. What it meant is, even back in the 50s, regulators would talk to you. Sort of talk to you. Maybe we'll talk about that sometime. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Alec Pierce, Scuba 2000, Vintage Scuba. Talk to you real soon.